we want to redefine excellence is a phrase we came up with the other day in a bit of a group meeting is redefining that excellence. And I think with that, we'll win with our best race. What does it mean to navigate the Olympic stream? What can we learn from the journey, the destination, and beyond? I'm Adam Creek, and this is Row Row Tokyo, exploring the past, present, and future of the Canadian rowing athletes on their path to Tokyo 2020. You're in for a good one, folks. Here we have the women's eight for Canada, and we've got 10 women on the call with us. We've got Kristen Kitt, the coxswain, hailing from the University of British Columbia and the St. Catharines Rowing Club. We've got Suzanne Granger, who comes from the London Rowing Club associated with that, although she grew up in Florida. And we've got Kaja Ruschella Wyszerski, who's from Calgary, started rowing in Calgary, but is also associated with the rowing club Daviron and Knowlton, just outside of Montreal. We've got Madison Maley, who's coming from the Burnaby Lake uh, Rowing Club. We've got Sydney Payne, uh, who's associated with Brentwood College Rowing, also has ties to Cal Berkeley Rowing. We've got Andrea Proshke from False Creek Rowing Club, UBC. And Lisa Roman, who also has uh, associations with the London Rowing Club. We've got Christine Roper, who's associated with the Ottawa Rowing Club, and Avalon Rostinez, uh, who came through RBC Training Ground to the University of Victoria. And finally, we've got Becca Zimmerman, who's associated with the University of Victoria. So strap in your seatbelts. Uh, this is the first time I've ever seen or heard or done anything like this. We've got eight women all talking, all top level athletes. You can figure out how these different personalities, these different people get it all to work together. The women's eight, what a boat. It's a big boat, lots of personalities, lots of individuals coming together for one purpose, making a big boat go fast. And you're in for a good listen today, everybody. You know, here we've got the Women's Cox State from Canada. We're going to have a kind of a banging conversation today. So we've got the, the Coxwain, eight rowers, and the spare. I'm going to work through the boat. I'm going to start with the Coxwain. Kristen Kitt, uh, Hiles from UBC and St. Catharines Rowing Club. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Kristen. Thanks for having us, Adam. What was training like today? Tell me a little bit about the water and the weather. Well, it's a little warm out uh, here in Victoria, BC. We're going through a little bit of a heat wave, which is, it's just fantastic actually, because it's um, added on a few extra days of heat training. We had a great row. Uh, we were under a bit of fatigue because we had some pretty hard pieces a few days ago and then also yesterday. And the women really devoted themselves to the rhythm and we had a great row actually, despite physical and mental fatigue. And it's just, yeah, it just, it's amazing. So tell me about the rhythm of this age. Each aid is really unique, actually, that I've had the opportunity to cox every boat. And uh, it's really a personality that develops over time. And the personality of this crew and the rhythm of this crew is starting to manifest each time we, we take a stroke, actually. It's a very leg-driven rhythm, which is just so special because it's you can feel the devotion of 16 legs going down as one. And we're really starting to feel the heartbeat of the boat, especially at race pace. And I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it because it's something that is very special special to us. And it's really starting to manifest every time we take a stroke and it, it really is becoming a heartbeat. Yeah. Well, the uh, shivers are broadcasting through the podcast waves too. I'm feeling them. <laughs> 16 legs is one. So tell me, you know, in the Coxwain seat, how do you feel? How do you feel the rhythm? I grew up horseback riding. I was a bit of a horse nut um, from about age three until age 15, 14, 15. And they teach you when you're horseback riding that you have to feel the horse. And, uh, so it's quite intuitive to me to feel a boat. So it's actually not really something I'm thinking about. It's just something that I'm present to. And so the rhythm right now feels like I'm very connected to it. It feels like it's, it's the boat is a part of me. It feels like the women are a part of me. And when I get to that point through, I, I don't really think about it too much. So it, 
it feels like a gallop. It feels like a really fluid gallop. Um, and it feels like we're just riding on top of the water. If I had to say anything about it. I love that. <laughs> a fluid gallop. You're not just a horseback rider, but you also have cycling in your background. Is that true? Yep. Yeah. I dabble a little bit. Yeah. What do you like about cycling? Well, my dream when I was younger was I just, I always wanted my, my teammates to respect me and I wanted to always feel connected to them. And this even goes back to high school. And so, you know, I'm very, very, very mediocre athlete. I am a very competitive person though. And so I got into cycling because I had a stretch fracture on my tibia back in 2013 and cycling presented a way for me to continue to work out and compete and try to feel to some degree what the rowers might feel. And it kind of snowballed to the point where I got a professional contract last year. Unfortunately, I didn't get to race because of COVID, but I had the opportunity in a previous year to race with the same team, InstaFun Let Premier Racing, based out of Vancouver, BC. And it's a cycling racing that's really challenged me mentally. Um, the tactics happen quite quickly and the pain is always there uh, in cycling races. And so it's the closest I've been, you know, to what these women feel, I think the six minute race, it's a very, very, very challenging distance. So I can't even imagine what they feel in a six minute race, but it's the closest that it allows me to feeling what my teammates feel. Let's talk a little bit about your path before we move on to the next one. And it's, you grew up in St. Catharines and I see that you went to under 23s and you also participated at the Paralympics as well as a coxswain. So I'd like you to kind of tell me about your start in the sport as a coxswain move through U23s to Paralympics to the senior level? Well, as I said before, I'm a very mediocre athlete. So in high school in St. Catharines, rowing is what everyone tries. And so I was, uh, yeah, I'm very mediocre track and cross country runner. And a lot of my friends signed up to try rowing. My grandfather, John Kitt, actually helped start the rowing program at my high school, Sir Winston Churchill Secondary School in St. Catharines. And it just so happened that one of the coaches knew him and put me in a really good boat in grade nine. And I mean, I was just horrible. I didn't know how to steer. I really liked talking on the microphone. I just was really bad. And so somehow I was allowed to be in this really competitive boat and we were quite successful. And I wanted to be accepted by my teammates and I love winning races. And I got really hooked in grade nine and started to look around and see what other kids were achieving. And in grade 11, it became aware of the junior national team. I tried out my first year in grade 11 for the junior national team. I didn't make it. I made the CanMX team actually with Christine Roper in 2006. And that that's really actually what lit the fire and, and made me aware that I could actually Cox internationally. It's, it's been challenging because as you may know, Coxons in Canada, there's one seat or there used to be one seat for women at the Olympic games. And it's very competitive with not many that have come before me. And so the path through is often unclear. And so those U2, three years, and then my experience both with the women's team and the Paralympic team has actually built me up to this spot. With the Para Games in 2012 and 2016, both very different experiences, both experiences that I'm quite proud of. 2016 especially, we had a really phenomenal team of athletes that came together in 2015 when the Para Rowing Team Training Center first opened up in Victoria. And we really built up that boat. And, you know, I was really grateful for the opportunity to be a part of that boat because they were athletes first and foremost. We worked really hard for that medal that we earned for Canada. So, yeah, and I thought I was going to retire after Rio. Rio. And I just want to pop in there. You know, you won the World Cup with the World Cup three and then you won bronze. Yeah. In a photo finish, too. We started the sprint just a little bit too late. We were 0.38 off winning silver. And I think it was 1.8 off of gold. So we started the sprint too late. And that's actually what I brought with me there, our 2017 eight is always start the sprint a stroke earlier than you think. And it's just amazing how these women totally trust me to do that kind of sprint. I guess to just encapsulate everything I've said, every experience I've been fortunate enough to be a part of, I've brought into this moment that we're in right now. Some good wins on your resume too, as I look at it. And we're going to move to the stroke seat. Uh, but obviously silver women's eight world championships, 2017, silver women's eight world championships, uh, 2018. So there's some good results. Uh, fourth place, 2019, uh, world champs in the women's eight. So let's move to stroke. Who's sitting in the stroke right now? Hi, Adam. It's Avalon. I'm sitting in stroke currently. Hello, Avalon. So can you tell me what this fluid gallop feels like? Uh, yes, I definitely can. Currently, 
what we found is our strength is our length and our power off the front. So when we get that going, it's like we just pick up the boat and then it just like flies backwards. It just is so easy and fluid around the back. We just get so much length around the front. And then once that's going, it feels really easy for me in stroke. Well, that's great. You know, what do you have to do specifically in the seat and in, in stroke seat to make sure that the boat's doing what it should do? Currently, what I'm focusing most on is just remaining very calm and being very fluid for everyone else and consistent. I sometimes like to just go really hard and put lots of big watts down. But what I've had to come to realize is that we we already have the watts. We have a lot of strong people in this crew. And the biggest thing I can do for everyone else is have a really consistent rhythm and just like have a very strong catch so we can pick up the boat. Tell me about how you came to this point in time where you are now yeah, so I actually started rowing in 2015. I joined our UVic novice rowing team. And before that, I was a competitive cross-country skier. And I uh, just, I guess I went through a period where I realized I didn't want to do that anymore. Even though it used to be my dream, I always wanted to go to the Olympic for skiing. But then in grade 12, I kind of felt like I needed a change. So my mother, who is a previous Olympian in rowing, was really adamant that I try rowing because she just felt like I'd be good at it. So she was pushing me and pushing me. <laughs> oh, sorry. Let's yeah. prop up your mom. What like what's her name? What's her Olympics? Her name is Heather Clark, and she was on the national team throughout the 80s. So in 1980 there was the boycott. In 84 she was a spare, and in 88 she raced in the women's cox four. Great heritage. What's what's your mom think about you going to Tokyo? Oh, she's just so thrilled you know like I, she, she's my biggest fan for she just has supported me the entire time and loves to be part of it I'm always sending her video and she's always giving me her feedback and she's just been kind of like a, a secret little coach who's been supporting me this whole way what kind of feedback does she give you uh usually she's confirming or, or helping me work through problems if I have something arise so that used to be more confidence issue I, I would find and she would kind of help reaffirm my thoughts on things. Tell me a story about that. I think I was trying out for the U23 team. And at this point, I had been training with the national team, but I was still very new. And I remember I was trying to get this this technical change down. I'm not completely sure what it was, but I just couldn't figure it out for so long. And my coach just kept pushing me on it. And I just, we weren't on the same wavelength. And I think it was a few days before racing uh, at trials. And I remember it just only started clicking in my brain and I went to my mom and I was like, mom, I think this is what they're talking about. Can you confirm with me? And she was just like, yes, that is, that is exactly what your coach is trying to help you figure out. And suddenly it was like a game changer. And I remember I figured it out perfectly and I can't remember what it was, but my coach was like, how did that happen? You figured it out overnight. So it's just little things like that where she's kind of just helped me figure stuff out. Yeah, an externalized brain to uh, speak through the intricacies of, of the sport. <laughs> That's a good tool in your tool belt. And so you went through the RBC training ground, is that right? Yes, I, I had already been rowing for a year at that point because I was training with our novice team at UVic. But then uh, my mom, once again, was the one who pushed me to try out for RBC training ground because she thought it would be a cool opportunity to get more funding. Tell me a little bit about the RBC training ground experience. I just remember showing up and it was like, there was just a, it was at our gymnasium at UVic and I just went through a series of uh, testing. And at this point I kind of was like, okay, like I'm just doing this for fun. And then I started noticing more media noticing me and I had people approaching me and I realized I was performing well at our local qualifier. And so I won that qualifier and then was um, sent over to regionals in Vancouver, where once again, I started noticing that I was getting quite a bit of attention and performed pretty well there and was named the um, regional winner for BC. And then from there on, it was kind of a catalyst for me in sport, just because I felt like it provided the funding that I needed at that point. I was working two part-time jobs, trying to go to school, learning to row, all of that. So it provided the funding which was incredibly awesome. How much funding do you get as an RBC training ground athlete? RBC will give the athlete up to $10,000 a year. And then the sport 
basically decides how much of that $10,000 to give to the athlete. And then they allocate the rest of it towards other parts of development in that, in that sport. So I got $6,000 every year for three years. Well, thank you very much, Avalon. And I'm going to keep moving along. Who's in seven seat? Hi, Adam. I'm in seven seat, Sydney. Tell me about seven seat and what's special about seven seat and uh, what do you bring to that part of the boat? For me, I think I really work on trying to pick up the boat with Avalon and help her carry that rhythm along and bring it down the boat together and find that really nice pickup to have that gallop that we've been talking about and just drive the legs down and pass that rhythm down. Okay. How do you pick it up with Avalon? For me, often when I'm having trouble matching up, it's my length through the front end because Avalon is so good at that. And most of the boat is really good at that. And that's something that I'm really working on. So finding that face out and relaxing. And I also think about the seat and the feet timing with the oar and finding that smooth face out and picking up the load with the legs. When you say face out, are you talking about your human face or the face of the blade? My physical face looking out of the boat, pivoting around the lock. So tell me what it was like rowing at Cal Berkeley on, on the estuary. I thought that that was the best place for me at the right time in my life. And I had the most amazing four years with incredible girls and an amazing coach. And I think that really made a huge difference in my rowing life and my school life as well. Who was your coach at Cal? My coach was Al Acosta. What did you learn from Al? He fostered a really great program where where all the athletes felt a balance of having a lot of fun and working really hard. And because we were at school, rowing wasn't our sole focus. We also had to go to school and do well. And it allowed for, I think, some of the stress to be taken off of rowing as a sole focus. And it really created a beautiful balance of working hard and having fun because you were there as a second thing to school. So it wasn't the be all end all for everybody. And you were able to let loose and row fast and work hard and have a lot of fun. That's really good. And you're a you're former alpine skier. Is that right? Yes, I am. Tell me how skiing is like rowing. I don't or, think it's anything like rowing. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how it's I different think that then. <laughs> there is there is the connectivity between your turns and skiing where you're linking up turns and there's the fluidity there that you can bring into rowing in the rowing stroke. But beyond that, I think they're very different sports. Well, they are very different. I, I want you to describe that just a little bit more, just in case someone has experience skiing who hasn't had experience, you know, flat water racing. Because I, I also found that I didn't take up skiing until after I was done rowing. And I was surprised at how much making a turn was sim- similar to changing the momentum in the rowing stroke. I guess I would find that in this arc of a turn, you apply your pressure at the top part of the arc. And then once you get to the middle, you're easing off your pressure to allow yourself to absorb the momentum to let your skis come under you, set up for your next turn, apply the pressure, and then move through the same stroke or arc. And it's similar to the stroke in that you're driving with the legs off the front end. When you come around the back, it's nice and smooth. And then you're relaxing, floating up to the catch to drive with the legs again. And so that motion is similar in the loading and coming off and relaxation to connect them and then you load and then you relax to connect. That's great. Well, thank you, Sydney. Let's move to the sixth seat. Hi, Adam. I'm Madison Maley and I'm currently sitting in six. Six seat drive in the engine room. That's where we want the aggression. So tell me about six seat and what you contribute to the six seat and what you find unique about that seat in the boat. I really enjoyed sitting in six. I think it's quite a rhythm seat to be supporting stern pair, but also giving the big watts so that it feels light for Avalon to set a really good rhythm. I think I've been really working on finding the rhythm around the back and then trying to jump off the front with Avalon and keeping that smooth, silky feeling between strokes. 
And so you're trained in classical voice, is that right? Yes. Yeah. How are you at singing O Canada? <laughs> Quite good. <laughs> 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 That's a loaded question, but um, did you ever do group choral singing, or are you more of a soloist? I started as a soloist doing pop music, then changed to classical, and through classical music, you definitely get a lot of experience doing choral singing, so I did it in my high school. I was on the North American Honors Choir. We performed in Carnegie Hall, which was beautiful. And then when I was at Northeastern, I also sang in uh, the NU Chorus. So lots of chorus singing. Oh, yeah. Those are great experiences. And I want you to pull it out, and I want you to find the similarity between choral singing and Bates rowing. I've seen a lot of studies of brainwaves, and when everybody's singing together, their brainwaves tend to truly sync up, and everyone's waves move together. And I've not seen a similar study in the boat, but intuitively, I feel like I've felt something. So I just want to dial in on your experience. Yeah, I think it's like when people watch rowing, they say, it looks so beautiful. It looks so easy. And that's how I feel about when you're singing in a group as well. Like you've practiced so many times. I can anticipate when the person in front of me is going to be doing something. And that's the same in chorus singing, right? You've practiced so many times and you know what that next sequence is going to be or when you're going back to the chorus or a different section of the music. And I think it's being able to anticipate those people you're performing with. And that's how I view rowing as well. Like we're going to perform at the Olympics and I know how, how incredible these other eight women in the boat are that I'm performing with. And we have rehearsed many times and we will keep rehearsing for the next few weeks until the show. But I do believe there's lots of similarities between performing on stage and I was a dancer as well. And so that same sort of thing with music and rhythm and like being synchronized. So yeah, I do believe there's lots of similarities. A lot of similarities. Well, dancing too, because you have to be so light yet Mm -hmm. dynamic and powerful. What kind of dancing were you trained in? So I was a part of a training program where we did ballet, jazz, hip hop, contemporary and modern. And I did that for about 10 years pretty seriously before I started rowing. And I think it really gave me a good feeling of my body and where I'm positioned. And Which dance discipline do you think gave you the most for this discipline of rowing? I'd say ballet is the fundamental dance class to take that teaches you a lot. Yeah, ballet. Well, thank you, Madison. Thank you. Uh, five seat. Who's my five seat? That's me, Suzanne. Suzanne Granger in the five seat, middle of the boat, set up the rhythm. Tell me about the five seat, what you like about five seat, and what you contribute through that part of the boat. Um, I really like sitting in the middle of the boat. I find it's a it's a great place to be able to sort of just work hard and try to support the rhythm that's happening in the front. We talk a lot in our rhythm about sort of everybody in the boat really driving the rhythm or the middle, like the powerhouse sort of driving the rhythm so that Avalon can really do what she does best and set an excellent rhythm for all of us to follow. But we have to help her set that up and give her the platform to jump off of. Um, But I, I like being able to sort of follow and work hard in the middle. We have call names for each other and my call name is Diesel. Avalon is snacks with two X's. <laughs> okay. Why is Avalon snacks? She always has snacks and always requires snacks. Why the two X's? Uh, it's more fun that way. Okay. <laughs> okay. Seven C. Sydney. Sydney is, uh, <laughs> her name is Skid, but it comes from Sid, Sid the Kid. And so it just sort of went together. Yeah, Sid the Kid. And then we got Madison in six feet. Madison is Barbie, but she has an alter ego, which comes out when we're training hard, which is Big Barb. (laughs) Should get her to do it in the voice. It's quite good. Okay, Madison, you're on. Big Barb. Big Barb. (laughs) (laughs) Legs. Give me some more Big Barb. What, What else does Big Barb say? 
legs. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, then you're the diesel. Who's behind you in four seat? Andrea. Andrea, Andrea is Terminator. And how is why is Andrea the Terminator? Uh, I think a couple of reasons. I think it, her German background. She is Terminator. She's strong and she goes after it. And Christine is Xena. She's our warrior princess. Two seat is Kasha, and she is cowboy. Okay. Why is she a cowboy, not a cowgirl? Uh, I don't really know. It just sort of happened. I think. Yeah, I think Kit told me that her and Madison started calling me cowboy in the stern and then I liked it so I just I ran with it yeah ride him cowboy well it kind of feels like you're riding a big horse uh, when you get into the bounds of the boat especially off the start and Bousy Bousy is Lisa she's shooter and Becca is uh we're I think we landed on easy we were really developing it she was given one before that we didn't didn't really make too much sense for her. So we had to make sure that she had a really great one that stood out. But I think we landed on Easy, EZ. Tell me about Kit and her call name. Oh, of course. Uh, Kit is Tornado. Why the tornado? <laughs> she is very much a tornado in that she sort of always has about a 20 sort of foot circumference of stuff that follows her around tell me a little bit about photography because i know that you studied photography and also a little bit of u.s canadian politics yeah so yeah i did a double major at the university of virginia it, well, one was photography and the other was american government um, i really enjoyed photography and specifically film photography how tangible it is and i really found that the quality and the richness that you get out of film photography specifically large format so like sheet film is just something that's quite uncompared in digital photography and i really enjoyed studying it and working in the dark room and sort of seeing something that you created in real life and took a photo of come to life in the chemicals and the trays I love my parents dearly, but when I told them that I was majoring in studio art, we had a very long conversation about what I was doing with my life and decided to also then add something else in my academic studies that could potentially be used more safely after university, which in hindsight, um, humanities was probably not the choice for that, but that's what it ended up as. I decided to do that at the end of my second year. And so I overloaded all of my courses and took um, 18 to 19 credits a year and finished a second major in American government politics. And I really just enjoyed it because I actually grew up in Florida for 13 years. And so studying the U.S. from the outside, from a different point of view was quite fascinating. Growing up in the States, I think it became clear to me when I left that people in power define history and that's how you learn it. And so learning it from the outside was quite fascinating. And I also realized that I learned strictly like growing up in younger years, U S history. And so coming back, did my, I did a master's in, in Canada, at the university of Western Ontario, or I guess Western university now. Um, and that's where studying it from the outside, I guess was quite fascinating because having done undergrad, and learning from the inside uh, about U.S. politics and then coming back and studying it from the outside and how the relationship between Canada and the U.S. sort of works and maybe why it is the way it is was quite interesting. So to be able to study everything from both sides was quite a really cool experience. Tell me about what you've learned about the difference between Canada and America and that relationship. And then see if you can draw any parallels between rowing competition. <laughs> It's a bit of an unpopular opinion, so I, I I don't want to offend anybody. But in my studies, I, I sort of found I my focus in my master's was negative political television ads, and so I sort of studied the comparison of America and the U.S. and their political leaders through that, and I found personally that Canada has sort of always been one step behind the U.S. in certain areas. And at least through 
political advertising, it, it looked, it was almost purposeful. Like we sort of said, oh, if the U.S. is doing that, we don't want to do that. Um, but then a couple of years later, end up doing it. And so watching advertising, it was quite interesting because there were political ads that presidents would put out. And then within like the next election, you would see an almost identical political ad that Canada released. I don't know if a direct like competition comparison is appropriate, but I can say that I think we're I we're slowly. I think we, Canada is getting better about supporting sport. I think that's one thing, especially going to an American school, that the facilities that we had were just unbelievable. And I think that Canada is starting to do a better job of recognizing the importance or the support that is needed, or just sort of giving athletes a, a platform to work off of so that, you know, they can inspire a nation. And why do you think the American culture has more support for their athletics than the Canadian culture has historically? Um, I think it might almost be a social thing. Like if you think about like college football is huge. And so I think it might just be a popularity thing. People like to watch it. So it sort of just snowballed. Honestly, don't really know benefited from it but i didn't particularly study the sports side of it yeah well thank you diesel i appreciate <laughs> your your insights and let's move to the the terminator andrea Proska. so you'll tell me about your german origins well my father is, has an amazing story that he showed up in canada with you know something like 20 bucks in his pocket and not a lick of English and, um, and made his way. So he, I'm very fortunate that my mother, when she met him, learned German. Uh, they uh, taught me German growing up and uh, I've always been close with my German family. So proud, yeah, dual citizen, but excited to represent Canada here. Yeah, yeah, well, how's it going? Yeah, thank you. Do you hang out with the German rowers much? Do you talk with those, those people? <laughs> Uh, I mean, we Instagram, the world is such a small place right now. So I think through Instagram, I've been fortunate enough to make some friends on the German team. And I think we have, uh, Tom was coaching over there too, for a while, who was on the Canadian uh, national team too, coaching our last silver medal. So yeah, you know, the world's a small place and uh, that's, that's great. Well, tell me about the four seat. What do you bring to the four seat and what you like about that seat and how you contribute to the boat? Yeah, four seats a great place to be. I mean, my job is to be strong, you know, br bring a little bit of chill hype into the boat. And we're in the back of a tandem, which for your listeners who might not be aware, that means that we have two port side seats back to back. And my job is just to attach my reins to the diesel engine in front of me. That's Suzanne. Support the drive as support and drive the rhythm in the middle of the uh, action. Yeah, I get to be right in the center of it all. Wow. Is it a double tandem? So do you have two port sides and two starboard sides? No, just a single tandem. So you have stroke seat and bow seat on the same side? Correct. And what was the logic behind the tandem rig? I think we've got some really strong people in bow and a, a really fantastic rhythm out of Avalon. So we're looking to just rig the boat so that we have the right people in the right places. What's special about being in tandem? What do you have to focus when you're that close and that linked to the person in front? I think it makes my job really easy. I've got a great example in front of me and uh, I can just really get into that flow state. Nickname being the Terminator, as perhaps so in coincidence, but I do have a tendency to overthink things. So process everything. So being behind Suzanne, there's not a lot of time to think. There's a lot of time to feel and I think that's when it moves the best. So just being able to get into that flow flow state, trust my body, and apply the good watt. So I actually, I love being in the back of the tandem. It's a great place for me. That's a good place. And you came from sculling. You're, you're a, bit of a, a bit of a sculler. From sculling to the engine room of an eight, it's a, that's an interesting transition. So what do you bring from a, a sculling background into you know, the traditionally more meaty, brutal sweep rowing? Absolutely. So most of my career was in a single. I started my sport journey with Rota Podium, where they had a lot of focus on single sculling. And then from the single went into the double with Gabby Smith until 2019, we finished fourth at the World Championships. I thought that sculling 
kind of it was akin to ballet, you know? Uh, when I'm talking to uh, someone who doesn't understand rowing, it's kind of like doing a clean while you use your oars in the same way a tightrope walker would use as his a balance beam and going as fast as you can in straight line backward. And when you have those two blades, there's a, a beauty and a finesse and a technicality to sculling that I really, really appreciated. And my exposure to sweeping wasn't very often. I usually I'd go in and I just kind of like dip my toe into the water and just hold on for dear life as you go from a single into an eight that's going, you know, high 30s or low 40s. Now, having spent more time in it, I think I really appreciate that a fast boat is a fast boat. And there's a rawness and a purity of power that um, sweeping has that I think I've just really been looking for in my rowing career. I think that I'm a strong person and I love to just be able to lay down some big watts. And then I can layer on top of that the technicality that sculling has afforded me and help drive that rhythm in the middle of the boat. Tell me about the first time you ever hopped in a powerful eight. Well, the first time I hopped into a powerful eight, I don't think I had any, any business being in there. I was in three seat and I just kind of like held on for dear life and went, whoa, I can't believe you can go up and down the slide this fast. Oh my God, what's happening? Don't catch a crap. But uh, the first time I rode was actually in uh, 2014. And I started rowing with John Wettstein through the Road to Podium program. Uh, up until then, I had no background in organized sports. And actually all I knew of rowing was this video of a jubilant Beijing men's eight singing in spandex at the top of their lungs. Maybe you know them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've met a few of them. They're good guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then had the benefit of being coached by Ben Rutledge, who was one of your teammates as well uh, in the Road to Podium program. But uh, my background was in hotel management. I was really just looking for a fun side project of something to fill my time. And I landed headfirst in this world of rowing and haven't looked back since. Hotel management. Wow. And and I'm just going to go back to the standard question. Like, How's rowing like hotel management? (laughs) Oh, man. Great question. And uh, a little nerve wracking because I believe that you've probably written a job about or a book about the differences between business and rowing. (laughs) I mean, the obvious answer is we're all in this together, right? We're all in the same boat. And so if the coxswain is the CEO, she may not do the same job as the athletes, but her job is essential. She needs to steer the ship. And we, as athletes or as teammates or as, uh, you know, frontline associates in the, in, the, in the department, need to be actively engaged You have to build teamwork and teamwork isn't built because we're working together. It's built because we respect each other. We trust each other. We care about each other. And I think that's something that this crew does very, very well. And I love that respect, the culture of care. We'll dig into that later. Appreciate your thoughts. I think it's time to get some words from Xena. Xena, warrior princess, three seat. Hello. You're the Jamaican in the boat. Yes, I'm the token Jamaican. I'm a good luck charm. <laughs> like a like a leprechaun. So uh, so tell me about the uh, three seat and what you bring to the three seat. My job is quite similar to a lot of the girls in front of me and that I'm just trying to stay as long and powerful as I can, pick up the rhythm that I'm feeling and seeing in front of me and send it send it back and I've got the tandem that Andrea was describing right in front of me and so I feel like if I can back them up as much as possible and just kind of keep the power going down the boat then I'm doing my job right. Well and it's interesting because the three seat at an Olympic level is very different from say a three seat at the college level which is very very different from a three seat at the high school level. So can you contrast how those at the different levels how the role of a three seat changes. If you're referring to how everybody likes to say that you put your worst athlete in the three seat because it's the boat, the seat least affects the boat. What I've heard before, three seat, newest in the boat or the next one to leave the boat. Yeah, well, <laughs> I really hope that that's not the case for me. 
Um, yeah, I don't know. I just try not to think about all of that and still be as confident. I'd rather win a gold medal in three seat than a silver medal in stroke. So that's my job. What I've found in, especially at the Olympic level, the three seat is very powerful and very vital part of the crew and of the boat. So I'm, I'm curious to see what you've discovered of, you know, how you can contribute in the three seat and what you've noticed being in such a high performing boat in three seat. Well, yeah, we haven't really touched on this much, but we're a pretty newly selected boat and we've been playing with a couple different lineups. So I haven't been sitting here for long and it's interesting what you learn in each seat, like what you need to be contributing. So I think that I'm still learning a lot about how I can best perform in this seat, but yeah, I mean, I'm eager to just continue to improve every day. And I do think it's quite simple. Like I said before, pick up the rhythm, support it, send it back. Well, I found, I always found whenever I rode in three seat, you could have a very strong influence on the length and really push the length in three seat. I was fascinated by that. Like you said, every seat, and I'm trying to pull a little bit of that out of the conversation, every seat kind of looks the same, but it also has its own little intricacy and finesse with it. And we joked about it at the beginning. You're from uh, originally from Jamaica. Uh, you're associated with the Ottawa Rowing Club. Tell me a little bit about that. And is there much of a program in Jamaica for rowing? Not yet. <laughs> um, I actually, yeah, I was born and raised in Jamaica. I'm a dual citizen. My father is Jamaican and my mother is Canadian. So I was born with both citizenships. Grew up there and didn't know what rowing was at all. I was a swimmer as a kid. And I went to a boarding school in Connecticut called Kent School. And they had a pretty good rowing program there and a strong tradition in rowing and I was six feet tall when I was 13 years old so they steered me in that direction and that's where I learned how to row and then um, got in contact with people in rowing Canada to pursue international rowing as there wasn't much of a rowing presence in Jamaica at all really so that's how I sort of got into rowing Canada through my dual citizenship there yeah. Do you have any visions of getting more rowing going in Jamaica? Yeah, I mean, I think the bobsled team did it. So I feel like the rowing team can try. Uh, no, I don't know. There are some small learn to row programs. And I think that there's a little bit of something trying to form. And so I do plan on going back home for a couple months after the games and getting involved with that could be something interesting, but not something that I've really looked into yet. Well, it's great to hear from you, Christine. And let's move into the two seat. Hello. Cowboy. It's Kasha. Kasha. Cowboy. Yeehaw. Ka Let's go. Okay. Love the outdoors. You started at Club um, Aviron Knowlton. Tell me about the two seat. I actually started in Calgary. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, but I'm from Montreal and I was born in Quebec. So I represent Quebec. But yeah, I started in Calgary. So I'm affiliated with Aviron Knowlton. But yeah. Oh, amazing. So a yeah, great place. Glenmore Reservoir. You got it. Yeah, yeah, good place to row. So tell me about the two seat. Tell me about the two seat. What's special about the two seat and what you give to? Uh, oh, and then that's the Calgary Calgary Cowboy. I get it. Yeah, I get it now. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> my my boyfriend's a bit of a cowboy. He's he's a legit cowboy though. So it. Uh, boots and hat. Boots and hat and farmer boy from Saskatchewan. So yeah. Deal. Lots of ties to the cowboy life. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Um, but yeah, two seat, like Christine was saying, we're a newly selected boat. So I haven't spent as much time in two seat recently. And then I've just been dealing with a bit of an injury. So Becky Easy has been helping us out with that, which has been super stellar of her. And so she's been filling my seat to help us out. But I was in two seat for a little bit earlier this year. And it's quite an interesting seat it's pretty awesome I honestly never thought or never pictured myself in two seat that much to be honest and I wrote it in 2019 at Worlds and and when you're rowing in the bow with with Lisa it's a pretty fun place to be in it's a really cool place to learn a lot and help the boat surge out of the water this boat has a, a really strong bow pair it's cool to feel like you can still contribute a lot of your power to the boat even though two seat isn't really known as like a power seat, I think traditionally, but 
it's been super fun to bring that power into 2C and while learning so much and focusing on technique. So yeah, it's been super cool. And again, it's all different. It, it evolves and it's different at the Olympic level because you don't have any slugs in the boat. <laughs> right? <laughs> Man, the depth of this boat and and the power in this boat, like there's so much strength and there's it's not even the depth of this boat, but the depth of this program and it just really speaks to what this eight is capable of, I think. Everybody's there in their seat and there's just a crap ton of power in this boat. It's really exciting. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun to be in a powerful boat. And you said you had a bit of uh you're dealing with an injury. I heard you had a bit of a bike accident. Yeah, I was at a training camp, had a bit of an accident. It was a pretty bad crash, but it's been tough, but it's brought out the best of this crew. Becca's just done an amazing job coming in, being part of this boat, and um, no matter the outcome of this injury, like this boat has the potential to win. You know, we've really had to rally around this injury, and it's been really cool to see everybody step up, being so supportive towards me, but also just kind of refocus on what the mission is of our boat and the bigger picture. And this is a crew of 10 people right now. And yeah, we're just rallying around our mission and that hasn't changed one bit. So if we can focus on that, like, I think that's where the success is going to be. How did the injury happen? I was just on a training ride with a bunch of my teammates and just had one hand off the uh, handlebar and then probably hit a pothole or something. And just kind of biffed it. And that kind of happens in sport. I mean, I also grew up alpine ski racing, just like Sid, and falls are kind of a part of my life. I, my nickname was Crasha for a while when I was skiing. So it is what it is. Sometimes life throws you these curveballs and just kind of happens. And I mean, I don't know if there is much to learn about it, uh, to be honest. Like, you don't want to stop doing the things in your life that you love because there's a risk because honestly there's a risk in in everything you do and sport in general there's a lot of risk and the sports I like to do carry even more risk than most I would say and and that's okay that's a risk I took and yeah the outcome is pretty crappy but but it is what it is I mean I'm not going to stop doing the things I love because there's risk involved there's always going to be a risk well, and what a great attitude, because I think that's a winning attitude, too. And hopefully that can carry on for the rest of the crew, because you almost have to have that that willingness to just go for it and not care. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And there's that risk in rowing, too. Like, it's just different. It's kind of funny, like, when you're alpine racing, it's like, okay, I could really seriously injure myself. And When you're rowing, I don't have that fear when I'm rowing. It's more like, okay, how far can I physically push my body and seeing the limits of the body that way? So yeah, there's risk there too. It's like, this is really going to freaking hurt. But it's kind of fun seeing what you're capable of doing even when you hit that threshold of pain and and it kind of mixes in with like adrenaline and, and drive and just pushing through it. And I think that's what I love about rowing is just seeing how far I can push my limit. And I guess um, a lot of that is due to the fact that I did grow up alpine racing and I do like extreme sport that has made me the rower I am. So I can't really be upset about all my experiences and all my other sports. Yeah. Really well said, Kaja. And let's bring in Becca. I'm sitting in two seat right now. Easy. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> tell, tell me about the two seat and what you're seeing, all those oars flailing around in front of you. Well, they're not flailing. They're actually perfectly in time. So I just try and match them as best I can. And honestly, right now, my biggest focus on, is on matching Lisa's power to try and keep the boat running straight because she's, uh, she's pretty powerful. You know, I'm happy to be there and happy to help out the crew as much as I can. Yeah. And so and tell me about your history and rowing. Uh, where did you come from? You grew up in Toronto. I see you have some association with Brockville, UVic. Tell me about that, your history. 
Yeah, actually, I started at a very small run club in Toronto that doesn't exist anymore, which is actually why I'm a member of Brockville, because I just needed a club registration. It was called Bayside Rowing Club. So I started rowing there in high school. That was a good rowing club with uh, Dominic Kahn, is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think you came one time and uh, right after the Beijing Olympics and you showed off your medal and I was probably starstruck. But I just want to talk about Bayside because I'm, I'm sad to hear that it's done because I've what I loved about Dominic Kahn, just from the ability to grow the sport, he had he was getting a bunch of kids from the inner city and throwing them on buses and bringing them down to Bayside and throwing them into these Viking boats and getting them to row around in the Viking boats. Were you, were you part of that at all? Yeah, I was. So I rode at Bayside, but then there was sort of an expectation while you rode there that you helped out with all the volunteer programs. And so I did a lot of coaching of the inner city programs high school kids, yeah, people, Dom wanted to give people who normally wouldn't have access to rowing because it's a very elitist type sport. He wanted anyone and everybody to have a try. He just wanted to get everybody on the water. So yeah, I was part of that for a long time. Great program. And so th- then you moved to UVic and you started training at UVic. I did. Yeah. I wanted to, uh, I think after Bayside, I was really hungry for you know, other people to row with and train with. I really thrive off a big program and UVic was the perfect place for me. Started there uh, a very mediocre club athlete. And when I finished up, that's when I made my first national team shortly after I finished my last year at UVic. So it was an amazing opportunity for me to go there. Yeah, that's great. And here you are, you're the, the ninth or maybe the 10th member of the team. How does it feel to be the spare and, um, to be supporting the team in the way that you are? Yeah, that's a good question because, you know, the spare is not necessarily where everybody wants to be, but my experience so far has been very unique. Like uh, I, before I was filling in for the eight, I actually spent a month in the women's four because they had an injury in their boat. I got to contribute a lot to their speed and their culture. And I'm happy that I was able to do that. Um, And now, you know, this is a very unique opportunity to be able to, fill in for Kasha in the eight. No, you know, it's not my first choice to be here, but I'm very grateful for this experience. It's been amazing. Yeah. How do you feel like you process the mixed emotions? Because there'd be some emotions having not made the boat and filling in as the spare. And you, know, you obviously said you know, you're grateful to be a part and grateful to support, but I just want you to talk me through that a, a little bit more. I think probably I'm still processing the emotions a little bit. I basically jumped into the four almost or right away as soon as I was named the spare. So that sort of became my focus right away. And then almost immediately after that, I jumped into being the spare for the eight. So I'm probably still processing things a little bit, but to be able to be productive and help out my teammates and crew and these both crews in such a big way, like I'm really grateful for that. Obviously not that those people got injured, but it's been a good experience for me. Yeah, well, definitely. Great to hear from you. And let's move to last but not least, the bow seat Hello, shooter. Tell me about the bow seat. I'm a pretty big fan of bow seat. I spend a lot of time there. Spent a lot of time in the bow of a four. Pretty much my whole career I've been in bow seat. It just seems very fitting and the right spot for me. <laughs> Tell me about the difference between the bow of a pair versus the bow of a four versus the bow of an eight. The bow of a pair, I feel like you're a bit more supportive in the sense of like off the front and just really trying to support whatever's being laid down in front of you. I feel like in the four, I have more of a responsibility of making the three people in front of me kind of meld together and then just supporting whatever that rhythm is. But it's just a bit, I feel like it's a bit trickier. And then in the eight, because it's so big, I always say like my biggest thing in the eight is like, if I can row well in the bow, then the eight's running really fast because that just means that it's like super set and I'm not having to do very much work. It's running perfect. If I'm not having to like really think about what's happening and I can just row like naturally, then that's a pretty fast eight, which I find that most days that that's how I'm training, which is great. Yeah. What do you do in the bow seat to make sure that the boat is comfortable for everyone in front of you? So I'm a pretty like back-ended rower a lot of my power comes in the back half of the stroke. And so I think 
because of that, I can really support like keeping the bow out of the water. And so I just try really hard every time I'm at the finish to like give as much pressure as possible to like extract the water and just like keep the bow surging off of every stroke. And I keep my focus there and then try to just be like loose and just in time as I approach the catch. But for the most part, I just really think about trying to stay as stable as possible and do the best I can. If the balance is super off, I try my hardest to just like really stay as level as possible or what I foresee as being level. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love how you talk to the idea of hydrodynamic resistance and how you can use your power to truly set up the boat in bow seat and really driving that finish contributes so much because if the bow sinks in, then it's wasted energy essentially. And it's, it's such a vital role, especially in the bows, uh, not just to you know, pick up the boat, but certainly send it, keep that, that haul out of the water. Your nickname is Shooter. Tell me about hunting. So I grew up in Langley and I did some hunting as like when I was younger uh, with my dad, not a ton, but enough to be like interested with it. And then we've done a ton of like trap shooting and stuff like that. I, when I was super young, I like won my first like picture at a trap shooting for being like the youngest shooter there and stuff, like literally hanging out with 70 year olds. But <laughs> at the time it was great. <laughs> what, what size of shotgun yeah. were you shooting? Uh, a 12 gauge. Okay. So tell, and again, this question, you know, how's rowing like shooting? Um, you obviously have to be super accurate. You could relate it to shooting in the sense of just timing. Uh, you have to kind of like be, be ahead of it or be in front of it to actually be able to bring something down. So if you're not accurate with your shooting, then you're definitely going to miss. I'd say like I've done mostly trap shooting, but I've definitely done some hunting out in the fields. And (laughs) I think, I think my best hunting story will be when one time my dad was out hunting with like one of his hunting buddies and his hunting buddy brought like a, this, this kid. And it was kind of like his first or second time. And there was like one duck that was flying over us and he was like, shoot it to his, this like new guy that had just started and he missed it. And then he was like, Lisa, shoot it. And then I shot it and killed it. And he, my, my dad's friend was like, Ooh, that's awkward. <laughs> Shooter. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. But then I also get the other side of it when I miss everything. So it's, you know, yeah. I get it both worlds from my father. So Yeah, no, but it's uh, this is your podcast. So let's just recount the victories. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's great. That's great. And um, you're a student of psychology. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I took psychology in university. So tell me what you've learned about psychology through this unique experience of women's eights rowing? Oh, we have multiple personalities in our boat, but I think having different personalities is kind of what makes the best boat, I would say. Like, if everyone's the same person, then it makes it really hard to make it run well. But I think we've got, like, a lot of strong-headed people, and then we've got some more quieter people. And so that combination of what everyone can bring I think that's just like what makes a perfect date. And then like, in a sense, like the physiology that people also have also changes or makes up like a good eight too. So like we've got some rowers that are really good at the start. And we've got some rowers that are really good through the middle. And then I feel like we've got some rowers that are really good to like haul in the back end of a race. And so I think having those different people makes up, makes up the best eight. So who are your starting cannons? Who blasts you off the line? Zena is definitely a starter. Cash is definitely a starter. I feel like Avalon's a pretty good starter as well. Suze is our diesel for sure. She's she's our, I would say Suze and Andrea are diesels in the middle. They're middle ground girls. The rest of you take it to the to the finish? Yeah. I feel like everyone kind of jumps in to take it home, to be honest. I feel like we all have some extra juice at the end. So it's always pretty exciting when Kit gives us that good call and we can get it going. So I feel like Madison's a really awesome finisher too. She goes kind of nuts at the finish. It's awesome. Barbie screams. <laughs> big Barb. Yeah, for some reason the big Barb doesn't come out very like aggressive in the last little bit though. It comes out very Barbie like in the last like 20 strokes. 
<laughs> it's amazing. I feel like a Viking warrior. She goes from very angry to like very, very high pitched, like classical singer in the last 20 strokes of a race for some reason. Uh, <laughs> a Valkyrie. <laughs> Great. Do people within the boat give motivation? So it's- yeah, I feel like we all do like a pretty good job to get each other hyped up, especially like if we're doing like super hard workouts, there's a lot. I feel like there's a bit more chit chat than normal, but yeah, we've definitely got some girls in the boat that'll give some hollers and races and kind of keep people on task. Uh, I think it's super motivational for everybody. And I think all of us are pretty open to it. And so, yeah, I think it's great. I think I love it. I personally love it. So, you know, if you're really tired and digging deep, like do it for the person that's cheering for you, as opposed to like thinking about, oh, this hurts, you know, like you can give a little more for that person. If you can't do it for yourself, you can usually do something more for someone else. A huge thank you to our title sponsor, Nicola Wealth, the gold standard of investment advice for affluent families, foundations, and institutions across North America. Nicola Wealth is also the premier partner of the Can Fund 150 Women, where women support female athletes and each other to achieve excellence. Nicola Wealth also has their own podcast, The Wealth Exchange. This show is full of great interviews and inspires you to achieve your aspirations beyond wealth. Providing access to experts, topics explore, leadership impact, wealth planning, and investing, philanthropy, and building better businesses. Listen to The Wealth Exchange with a quick search for Nicola Wealth on your favorite podcast listening app. Let's open this up a little bit. So tell me what it's like on the start line and what's going on at the start line. I feel like a lot of us are trying to work into the nervousness. So like, you know, almost trying to like amp ourselves up to feel nervous if we're in a training session where we're doing starts and we're alone and nobody's next to us, or at least for myself, I try and keep calm at start line. And as we've been training recently, like, I feel like I'm like, nope, let all the nerves come in. And so you can feel them and then know how to deal with them. Andrea, I think you were kind of talking about that too recently. Yeah, I mean, I like to kind of picture myself as like a pot of water just on simmer. You're going to feel these butterflies. You're going to feel nervousness, but that's natural because part of the beauty of the sport is kind of feeling the fear and doing it anyway. So you're going to have these waves of of emotion, but just being on the start line. And then when the starter says go, you turn up that heat and the world just kind of melts away and you know exactly what to do. What does it feel like in the front of the boat off the start? Well, usually up in stern, like I know that everyone's going to follow me and I I can get kind of carried away. Uh, Everyone knows that I like to jack the rate rate up really high. (laughs) How high is the rate going off the start? I think we usually try to be around like 44, 42. Yep, I think. But then sometimes it can go a little bit higher. It, it kind of depends. I, I Lately, I've been trying to just be a bit more calm and let us find and gather together, um, especially off those first two strokes where we're just thinking around the back squeezing. And then on the, the next three, we're just thinking legs and like hammering down the legs as much as we can to get the boat up and running. And the start is a ton of fun. Oh, I love starts. I think they're such a cool opportunity to just really nail in on on yourself and your own emotions and just like get really hyped. But like you just have this cold energy when you're sitting at the front line, the start line where I'm just focusing in on my breathing and just calming myself down, but just laser focus and waiting for that first initial noise from the starter. Yeah, I love that coolness. Hey, who's your coach right now? Michelle Darvel. Tell me about Darvel. Suzanne. Oh, Michelle's the best. I think it's kind of cool to be coached by her right now given that there's actually some of us in the boat who were first coached by Michelle like 10 plus years ago. Personally, I started my senior national or I guess national team journey with her at U23s and and finishing it with her at the senior level at the Olympics. So it's quite it's quite poetic in that way and I I really trust what Michelle does with us for training and our programming and I, I love that she really treats us like people. You can feel how much she wants the best for us and how she always says, you know, this is, you know, your journey. You can take the steering wheel. I'm just here to guide you. Like I want, I want you to be as fast as you can be in your best athletic self. 
um, on top of being your best whole version of you. So I'm, I'm a big fan. <laughs> yeah. Big fan of the whole self coaching. You know, that's, I want to dig into that, but I first, I'm still stuck on, on starts and even workouts and tell me, give me a couple examples of some classic Michelle Darville workouts you know, to give speed to the boat. Michelle loves the lack tap workout. The lack tap. Yes. Tap into the, uh, Lactic acid, I guess, in your system. It's one that she's, I think, pulled from some previous coaches that we've worked with. But uh, when we were in London, some of the like Western coach, Volker Nolte, really loved this workout. And Michelle's definitely carried it on with us. But you essentially do some increasing rates for what adds up to be eight to 10 minutes. And then you just immediately shift down into like the hardest, most powerful like rate 22 you could ever imagine to just force your body to use the lactic acid that you've produced as energy and just force it to flush it. Um, and it really, really hurts. It, uh, we do it multiple times and we'll, you get a little bit of rest and just kind of keep powering through it. And it's a tough one, but I think we come off the water and you just really feel like you've accomplished something. And that I think we usually learn a lot during those workouts too, with rhythm shifts and changing rates. I love that workout. It's reminding me when I was down at Stanford University, we used to do workouts like that. It was called the cliffhanger. And we had this giant guy in the middle of our eight, and we'd, you know, we'd ramp it up to high stroke rate, I don't know, 32, 36, whatever we're doing, and then drop it down to the 2022. And he catches a massive crab right after we go off the cliff. And in this guy, he's you know, six foot eight, 220 pounds. He tries to like lean on the oar handle and the oar uh, ends up ejecting him. And I've never seen such a big human fly <laughs> through the sky. And he's flying through the sky. He's like, Jesus! Adam, we have a similar story to that. Okay, share it. <laughs> when, when we were training in Amsterdam, we were training in two fours and with our big group and Unfortunately, Kasha, classic, got ejected from R4. Maybe she can tell you about her experience flying through the air and losing her Oakleys. <laughs> yeah, I got I got bucked off the bronc. What Madison isn't telling you is that I, it was her responsibility to not throw me in the water, you know, being in bow. But um, I believe she still owes me a pair of Oakleys, as does the uh, bow seat of the other four. But it's okay. We had a little T-bone experience, Adam, and unfortunately, Cash's oar got caught on the bow of the other boat, and she flew out, but it was quite memorable watching it happen, and I'm glad she's okay. she was okay. <laughs> it was a bit of a shock. I just remember popping out of the water, and I was pretty winded, and I was like laughing and crying at the same time, but uh, Madison was trying to ask me if I was okay, but she was laughing so hard as she was asking me. And then we went back on land and the Dutch coach came over and she's like, I thought I heard a gunshot, but it was just you on the rigger. It was uh, uh, definitely one for the the memories, for sure. (laughs) Smash, slap. That's great. And so someone else jump in. Tell me about Michelle Darville and how she coaches this boat and how she coaches the program. I feel like Michelle is very she's very passionate about rowing and like all the success I think that she had. And I think seeing us win a gold medal in 2011 and seeing all the girls, like the veterans coming back and all these amazing girls that came after us, we've had two, a couple under 23 women's eights that like won some gold medals as well. And I think the building of the program has made it really inspiring for her to see it through with us. And I think she's a passionate coach. She cares a lot. She'd do anything for us. That's what I love about Michelle. I know that she also does a really good job at like working everything she can to make sure that we're getting what we need. So she, you know, she works with a physiologist. She works with anyone that can help support our team. She's willing to ask those people for help. She's willing to, you know, if we say like, let's try to do workouts with the guys, like she'll try to make workouts so that we can work with the men. Like she's always open to uh, suggestions and she's always open to change if we need to change things. And I think that her being so open to us and, um, just loving them the sport, I think that's what makes her such a great coach. 
Yeah, she does a really good job of like holding her ground when she needs to, but she uses her resources really well. Give me a for instance. Uh, like I think she uses our physiologist to like help her build a program. So if she's got like a what she thinks would be good for us during a certain training block, I think she takes the time to you know, talk to the people that are experts in physiology to be like, hey, like, do you think this would be good? And then I think she also takes how we're feeling into account as well. Like if she thinks, oh no, I need to pull you guys back a little bit. Like this has been too much and she'll pull us back a little bit if she needs it. Hey, no, this week you're going to be, we're going to beat you up this week. Like this is what's happening this week. Then she'll push us to do that. How does she judge if you are pushed too hard or not pushed hard enough? We're not very quiet about it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we also we have a monitoring system that we use um, to gauge how we're feeling on levels of soreness, fatigue, how well you slept. Um, so there's a, a a bit of a system there that she can check. It's a journal or or a computer cell phone app. Yeah, it's a phone app that we use. It does is there a brand behind the app? It's called Smartabase. That's great. So you have feedback. And again, walk me through the questionnaire. And do you enter this every day, once a week? Every morning. Every morning. So walk me through all the questions you answer, enter into Smartabase every morning. Currently, they include a lot of COVID questions. Okay. So <laughs> those that's the start of the questions. And then, yeah, it's just like, how sore are you? How tired are you? How did you sleep? How are you? Like, are you irritable? Are you not irritable? Resting heart rate. Okay. That's fascinating. Do you have any other, you know, tracking? Do you have, you know, actometers to track your sleeping or is it all just self-reported? Yeah, we usually use heart rate, but I know there's, I think Sid has a a whoop. Um, Yeah. So I have a whoop and um, I really enjoy using it because of the way that it frames the data that it gives you. It's very recovery centered and strain centered rather than congratulations, you burned 2000 calories today. Like it's um, you put this much strain on your body. You need this much recovery. You're this much percent recovered from the day before. Uh, I really love the way that it interprets your data and presents it to you. And I think it's a great training tool for that. That being said, it is a risk sensor. So it is not as accurate in the heart rate data as my chest sensors. So I do take this data with a bit of a grain of salt, but I think it's the whole presentation of it that I'm really interested in. Well, tell me a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. So it has a journal function in it that you can customize what kind of questions you want to add to it. And so they'll range from like, did you sleep in your normal bed? Have you traveled? Did you use earplugs? Like any kind of thing that you want centered about your sleep to um, what kind of food have you ingested that day to what kind of mentality did you have towards your day to um, how are you feeling just in general? Like what's, are there any new things happening in your life and all sorts of, there's specific questions within each of those categories that I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, it gets you to look at, well, you can customize it to how you want it to look, but I think it gets you to look a little bit deeper into how you're feeling about your day-to-day training and how you um, are recovering and how you're treating yourself. So what patterns or epiphanies have you gained by using Whoop? According to Whoop, I am continuously overtrained and never recovering. (laughs) It's one of the great patterns that I will always see. There's a few other girls on the team that also have them, and two of them are in the four, and we all live together, and we like to look at it. The monthly data that gets compiled together, and we all laughed because the only time we went into the recovered phase was when we got uh, a week or 10 days off at Christmas, and we were training at home. And that's the only time that we were not overtrained. So its metrics are a little bit off for our training load. Yeah, that's fascinating. And if I can just jump in about Smartabase, when we're talking about the mental health versus the physical health, one of the really cool parts of Smartabase is that it personalizes it to yourself. So I might naturally have an irritability level level that is higher or lower than someone else. So when my numbers change, it's reflective of what my data is and what my history is. 
And as it's been explained to me, if you see someone's mood significantly drop three days in a row, you have a higher increase of a physical injury after that as well. So that's why this is such a valuable tool for us, because it's not just about mentally feeling uh, you know, ready to work, but also preventing injury to being able to perform more often. Um, I've just used it as a healthy outlet to give me context to my training, but um, because I don't have that much authority over our training program, but it is definitely a valuable training tool to look at your uh, short-term and long-term recovery and how you can maybe help better it. Yeah, well, that's really fascinating, the, the mental physical connection, the mind-body connection. Do you find that you generally get along as a crew or do you ever have arguments? I think we're pretty good as a boat. I mean, conflict is natural. It's going to happen. Given that we have so many different personalities, there's always difference in opinion. But I think one thing that's pretty special about this boat is how we come out of things like that. Uh, We worked really hard on having a good culture. And I think one of the main things of that is how much we've been trying to communicate and remain open with one another. Conflict can actually be beneficial if it's done so in a way that's productive. So if we can share those differences of opinions and learn from one another, because sometimes, you know, someone makes a call and there's a difference in opinion on how it should be interpreted, it can actually open your eyes to potentially another way to think about something. And so I think we've done a really good job of creating outlets as an eight to allow people to be heard. So tell me how the, a balanced conflict would show itself. Well, yeah, if you're, I mean, if we're rowing along in the practice and people in the boat are a bit more sensitive to feeling it down on starboard, for example, and other people might feel it down on port, that's just a very basic example of a difference of opinion and trying to work through problem solving while satisfying everybody is a key part of what this boat's trying to do right now. How do you get from disagreement to a unified path forward typically? I mean, I think the biggest aspect is probably approaching it with a bit of a give and take standpoint. So I think you always need to hear out the other opinion, even if it doesn't match what you're thinking and And then taking the approach of, okay, what can I do to help and what can you do to help? And that way we're all sort of in that give and take mode of trying to contribute to problem solving. I think the second you start pointing fingers or or only noticing other people's flaws, that that can get a bit dangerous and create tension and hostility. And we're just trying to always be working together. And I think we know each other so well at this point. We mean, we've been around each other all day, every day for the past couple of years. And so yeah, just being really open to that communication and not only asking of others, but also providing how you think you can help the problem. How does feedback tend to happen? Like Lisa said, we were a pretty vocal crew. I think we like to give each other helpful feedback. I'm probably not the right person to ask because this is like a huge area of improvement that I think I have to work on. But I think when, you know, when the boat is stopped or after every single session, we debrief what we've been doing. And that's usually a pretty open space for everyone to provide their feedback and accept feedback. But it's always done in a very helpful way. And I I think we all know that it's nothing personal. It's all, you know, any feedback or, or observations that are noted are all just due to trying to make the boat faster. It's nothing personal. I see that there was a personality assessment that went around. How about I go down the boat and I want you to self-identify as your your dominant and subdominant personality trait and just go through the DISC assessment. We've got dominance, we've got inspirational, we've got uh, steady and conscientious is what I'm thinking off the top of my head. And so typically you can have one that's larger, one that's smaller, and that influences the way that you both deliver and receive communication. Three seat, I guess, eh? Uh, So if you, (laughs) and Christine's saying in the chat that she doesn't even remember hers. So (laughs) shows you how much (laughs) three seat. (laughs) So Kaja is saying she's dominant, you know, hundred (laughs) percent in the chat. Kristen's saying that she's creative, conscientious, I was very much conscientious and I was actually classified as perfectionist, 
which explained a lot about myself given how I ice cakes and how long it takes me. So yeah, conscientiousness. And it's interesting with personality, you have both positive and negative traits that can come uh, to play in them. And it's yeah, perfectionism can be something that's good and it can also be something that can get in your way too. I believe it was described to me as a recovering perfectionist. Oh. <laughs> Suzanne with the, the, the big C, and uh, who else wants to talk about their personality? I can go. It's Kit. I actually was high on D and C, so I was high on dominance and conscientiousness, um, which is a bit of a, an unusual pattern. Yeah, I'm a bit in a middle, middle ground, um, and it's sometimes I think that relates to being a coxswain because it's, as Christine said, it's you've got to see the situation from a few different perspectives to come to a result or come to a um, consensus. So I actually thought it was quite funny when I got this because I was like, oh, that's actually a perfect coxswain. Dominant yet conscientious. Uh, it's a good, uh, some good traits to have. And so Kristen, because you get to know the the rest of the crew too. So let's, let's talk through this because as, as a coxswain, you're, you're a little bit of a coach as well. And you're observing the crew from a slightly different perspective. So let's go uh, Avalon. Where is she on the disc profile? You know, I actually couldn't answer that. Yeah, I uh, I really couldn't answer that. I just know, I know my teammates intimately and I would actually digress that I don't really feel like I'm a coach. Um, some coxswains might feel that way. Some athletes might feel that way, but I just, I feel like co- being a coxswain is not a coach. Actually, it's about being a teammate who knows a little bit about rowing, but really takes on the feedback from the athletes to make the person a, personality of the boat happen okay well we're going to get to avalon soon but let's dig into this a little more because i i like where you're taking this tell me how you are a good teammate as as a coxswain and uh, and how you bring that team personality to the boat well the main thing is is i try to listen to all the women that's the beauty of the eight is there's no superstars um at least that's my opinion and um, it's really about the collective. And so for me, I try to listen to each of the women and implement what they want in the boat. So that way everyone has a unique piece of the boat and they can feel proud of it and they can feel like it's their baby and then embody what the coach wants as well. So working, having a close working relationship with the coach, I think is really important for Coxon. We're kind of a little bit in no man's land sometimes, and it's this intermediary between the personality of the crew and the women and, uh, but also honoring what the coach wants and respecting the coach. So I think that's how I try to be a good teammate. The main thing is listening. Mm-hmm. Listening and having that fine balance. So Avalon, where are you in the personality piece? Yeah. So I got the inspirational, which basically means I'm high in influence and dominance. And uh, some of the tendencies that I think I, personally really relate to for influence would be creating a motivational environment and encouraging that and thriving in an environment that's really motivational, like most people would. And then also just being someone who likes to generate enthusiasm and uh, always trying to like look at situations with optimism. So those are some traits that I find that match up quite well with what they say on the disc assessment. And then for uh, being more dominant I find that this is maybe more in rowing and more dominant, but in everyday life, perhaps not so much, but I always like challenges and just making things happen. So I am quite adventurous in that way. And I always accept a a challenge. You know, and I think the dominance when you're talking to it from a personality standpoint, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, I think it's more about your attachment to ideas. And when you have an idea, how willing you are to, you know, go to bat for that idea and how how tight you hold on to it and let's go down the seventh seat we've got Sid the kid so i was the investigator pattern which is high in s and c but mainly in conscientiousness and c and uh one of the things that it said was that i influence others by determination and tenacity and that overuses some bluntness (laughs) and but overall that it's generally an anchor to reality as this position and I think that's fairly true stay rather calm under pressure and uh, I think that comes through with the conscientiousness and the steadiness yeah fascinating okay go down to six seat 
I was actually the same as Avalon, so inspirational. I think we both thrive in the same sort of environment, and I think that's what our our team culture has been this year. So I think it's really provided us all to be successful. But, I mean, this year has been challenging for everyone with COVID. Some people haven't seen their families in a long time, and their spouses have been away from them, and I think us all supporting each other has been really, really integral to our success so far. And, and I think that these personality tests, yes, helped us see um, or confirm some things, but we all know each other inside and out. So it's, it's a pretty cool team environment. It's a good team environment. And I think there's, you know, there's kind of a back of magazine thrill of doing these personality tests, which is like, okay, now I know it. Goodbye. I think when you're talking about a high performing team and I think you're, you're hitting on Madison is that these, you know, there's a few steps like one on a low performing team, you think that everybody operates in the exact same way that you operate. And you know, just because you respond to one certain type of stimuli, whether it be you know, a loud voice or a pat on the back, doesn't mean that someone else is going to respond to that exact same stimuli. I guess the first step is one, recognizing what sort of uh, stimuli get you going and make you work you know, as an individual. And then two, in a big team like this, recognizing what each and every one of our, your, our teammates do and what gets them going. And then three, learning how to adapt your behavior so that one, recognizing, hey, wait a second, myself in you know, six seat or, or three seat or, or bow seat is very different personality-wise than this other person and the way I need to approach them, you know, I just need to tack my uh, technique just a little better. If I want to get my point across, I want it to be heard and I want to make sure that we're getting the best decision possible for the boat. Most times we get it right, but we all know how each other like to get feedback and I think we've kind of perfected it now. But of course, we all make mistakes, but I think we know how each other work best and what motivates each other. And they're completely different. I mean, it's funny right now with the lineup, I think Sid is a lot quieter than Avalon and I. And sometimes we have to ask her for her opinion. And, and it's normally much more insightful than what we have to say. So I think it's important to get the quieter ones to speak up because they've got a great voice. Well, and, th and that's the truth, right? The investigator, the big S is the big C's. Terminator is a persuader, so I'm high on influence and second lowest on dominance. That means that the harder something is, the more challenging it is. I think the more I'm interested in it. And I like to have flexibility in creating our own environment, not doing something because that's how we've always done something before. And I think that that's what Michelle, getting back to your question about that, does really well. I mean, she had only been with us for a little bit of time before COVID hit, and she used that as an opportunity to kind of team build by correspondence. You know, we came back from the COVID break stronger, you know, physically and mentally doing things like this, her taking the time out of our, in our schedule to make space for doing these assessments is part of what makes her a really awesome coach. Yeah, that's really nice to hear. And that's really neat to hear that support. And so we've had Zena <laughs> in, in three seat. Are you still, is it still a mystery? <laughs> I've been reminded that I'm a dominant. <laughs> the, big, the big dominant in three C. Uh, but I don't think that's a bad thing. No, definitely not. And again, it's there's nothing wrong with any sort of personality. You know, what's wrong is when you don't recognize it, and own it yourself, and then you don't recognize that other people are different than you. That's when the whole personality thing goes wrong. And then we've got the two seat. Yeah, so I am uh, uh, inspirational. I'm, I'm the exact same as Avalon and and Madison. And one of the traits is uh, using a lot of humor. And if you know those other two girls, I would say that's pretty accurate. Yeah, so I'm Kaja, you know, the Joker in two seat <laughs> and uh, bow seat shooter. Yes, I'm a dominant. You're dominant. Straight yep, up. and I'm a okay with it as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just owning. Yeah. That. How, how about you, Easy? The spare. Um, I am very high S and C. I'm a perfectionist, like Suzanne. Um, which honestly, 
I, that's not a word I would use to describe myself. But when I read the description, I was like, oh, okay, I see that now. I'm very influenced by other people and like their personalities. So I like it things to be kind of like steady and I go with the flow. And I guess that kind of makes sense for me in my position right now. So. Well, that was fascinating. I wasn't expecting to go there in this conversation, but I, I love it. You know, we're looking forward to the race. And I'm curious, are you primarily internally focused or do you have your sights set on any other crews out there when you look forward to the racing? I can try to jump in on this one, Adam. I think that that's a really good question. And I think what's so unique about this Olympics in particular is that we haven't raced any of our competition in almost two years. The, you know, 2017, 18 and 19 all saw different people on the top of the podium or different countries on the top of the podium. And because of that, I think it does force a bit of an internal focus in that because it's been two years, we don't really know where we stand in comparison to our competition. I think in an event like the women's eight with only seven entries, you'd be silly not to respect all of your competitors and expect everybody to come with their a game and be and be really fast but right now we've got a really good internal focus we're playing to our strengths i think we kind of have to do that with not knowing where we stack up next to our competition we just have to know what we're really good at and try to race in an offensive mindset with this unique situation yeah yeah there's not a lot of competition that's that's actually going to make it exciting there's a lot of discovery that's going to happen throughout the Racing. Yeah, I think Suzanne and I were actually chatting to um, Kevin Light, who was one of your teammates back in Beijing, um, and he gave us some really good advice to, it could be a very blink and you miss it situation, I think, in the heat when we're lining up and we're racing everybody for the first time, instead of sort of looking around and just wondering who's fast, who did it right, did we do it right, did they do it right, like really trying to keep the blinders on and do our own job and stay focused on what we came to do and not get distracted because it's been so long since we've raced. Um, and I think, I think we're all doing a really good job of trying to bring that to how we train. We want to redefine excellence is a phrase we came up with the other day in a bit of a group meeting is redefining that excellence. And I think with that we'll win with our best race. So we just have to approach it that way. If that makes sense. Yeah, that does redefining excellence. Lisa, dig in, tell me what that means. Um, I think it's just like finding new ground, like doing something that all of us in this boat have never done before and like having, having our best race on the day that it matters the most. And I think if we can come away with that, then that comes with everything we want. Like if we have our best race, I think that comes, that comes with a gold medal. So we're just, that's what we're doing. What's what we need to do. And we all know that. And so yeah, I mean the playing field at the end of the day, all these athletes are training super hard. We're all very fit athletes that are going to be sitting on the start line together and if you took one boat or another, I think you know, when it comes down to it, we're all pretty close in time and everything else, but it really comes down to like that mental game that we're all going to play and who's going to want it the most and what do we do, what do we have to do to get that and get it on the right day. Mhm. And so do you have any rituals that you have as a team that help get you on the same page mentally, help you sync up? Kit does a really good job of like keeping us together. Yeah, I would say for sure. Yeah, you're, you definitely have that right, Madison. Kit's like the, the beat of the drum for sure. And she constantly reminds us of our competition. She somehow made a very challenging row today um, a lot easier. Yeah, just, she always reminds us of what we're doing, what our goal is, and who we're going to be competing against, and how fast we need to go to make our goal. Oh, that's great. You know, hop in there, Kristen. Um, I don't really know uh, what else I can add, to be totally honest. Um, I really, 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 from the bottom of my heart, believe in these women. We've got something really special here, Adam, and I feel a lot of trust from the, these women, and we've been together for a very long time now. And we've been through a lot and we're going to continue to be through, go through a lot, but we've been through a lot. And I think that brings us together. We're not your normal run of the mill rowing eight. We've got a lot of scars, both physically and 
uh, emotionally and those scars bind us together. And, you know, it really comes back to what we do on a day-to-day basis. And these women, they've gone to places that I don't even want to discuss and back for me. And so it's very easy to cox on tough days because there's just so much buy-in. There's so much trust. So much buy-in, so much trust. And you make me think of one of the key sponsors of this podcast and of yourselves, uh, which is Nicola Wealth, who sponsors the Can Fund uh, with the 150 Women Project, Women Supporting Women. And I just love to hear your thoughts about the idea behind this campaign of women supporting women and what it means to you. Yeah, well, that's pretty easy to answer because I think in this situation, there's a lot of people out there that say, oh, we want women supporting women, but it's actually Can Fund that went through the process and is actually uh, bringing, uniting women across Canada to support us and support our dream. And it's actually quite powerful. And when we get to that start line, we know that there's women backing us as we try to achieve something that that hasn't been done in a very long time, actually. It's very meaningful to go to a start line with the support of, you know, Can Fund and 150 women. Okay, yeah, that's amazing. And it's great to know that you have a community of people uh, supporting you. I want to thank each and every one of you for all the time that you've committed to this conversation and wish you all the best. Yeah, you have an incredible crew with an incredible culture uh, and an incredible drive. So it'll be, it'll be fun to watch your journey and see you and get to that start line and then through the finish line. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Thanks so much. Thanks thank so much. You. Thanks, Adam. It was, it was a really neat opportunity, I think, uh, for us to come together in this format. I mean, I kind of knew what people were going to say, but at the same time, it was just really, it was actually really special to hear, hear a few of the comments. Um, and I think this was actually a really cool team building exercise. You know, the hope that's kind of a bit of the hidden agenda is to, to support all of you in your journey. And it's, you know, it kind of, you know, brings tears to my eyes even when I come out and I, I see the, you know, you, you don't realize it at the time, but you're still pretty young when you're doing the Olympic journey. And there is, uh, you know, a lot of opportunity that you have in front of you. And there's just, you know, a zest and energy and you know, experience that you have the opportunity to have that most people don't. So it's, you know, enjoy every single moment of it. <laughs> enjoy the ups, enjoy the downs, the scars, the falls off the bike, the, you know, getting back together, uh, the arguments in the boat. The, the great stories that come from it because it's all it's all part and parcel and it's uh, really a thrill to watch you go through it what a show I loved it I love the conversation I love the energy I love the fun I just wish we could have peeled back another layer or two of the onion I love the nicknames it seems to be something that goes a long way for building a sense of team, for building an appreciation of uniqueness and kind of honoring the individuality of everyone. And really, it, it truly sounds like each of these women honors the uniqueness of what they contribute to the boat. It's no slow boat by any means. I truly like what the diverse backgrounds that they bring you know, from photography to biking to classical voice to alpine skiing to gardeners to you know, shooters to you know someone born in jamaica so there's people from all over the place in this boat and i think that's truly what defines an eight you know, diversity of experience diversity of thought diversity of personality united by one mission united by one vision and this mission and vision is one of support one of excellence of defining their excellence for themselves and executing on that watch out for the women's aid the canadian women's aid in tokyo 2020. if you're enjoying this podcast and are wired for growth check out my audiobook or paperback called The Responsibility Ethic. I wrote this book for listeners keen to carve their own path to achievement. You'll find 20 years of my life experience summarized into seven hours of listening, or 3.5 hours if you're like me and listen to all your audiobooks at two times speed. 
<laughs> You'll find business case studies and personal development insights packed in a narrative of Olympic failure, Olympic victory, and yes, there's my team's rowboat capsize in the Bermuda Triangle. Find the audiobook or paperback where all good books are sold, including Amazon, Indigo, and Audible. For more information, visit my website, creekspeak.com. That's K-R-E-E-K-S-P-E-A-K.com. Thank you for listening to Roro Tokyo. Again, I'm your host, Adam Creek. Feel free to reach out to me with comments on Twitter at Adam Creek. That's at sign A-D-A-M-K-R-E-E-K. No, it's not like the river or the squeaky door. It's a creek with a K. A huge thank you to our title sponsor of this podcast, Nicola Wealth, the gold standard of investment advice for affluent families, foundations, and institutions across North America. And another thank you to Whitehall Rowing and Sail and the Oarboard, which is the transportable, collapsible rower that you can take anywhere. Thank you, Growing Canada, for your support to wrangle these athletes. And thank you, CBC, for promoting these conversations on your massive platform. This show is produced by the wonderful Mary Chan of Organized Sound Productions. The sound is edited and mixed by the creative Danelle Cloutier.